Hi, and welcome to our final video in the communication section of our course. This video deals with the relationship between communication and behavior. We're going to start with ants, because ants are cool, and they do cool things, and they have really cool behaviors. This ant is milking aphids. It's not actually getting milk, it's basically getting a high sugar secretion that the aphid produces as the aphid sucks sap from a particular tree. These ants are honey ants. Uh, members of the colony store a high sugar solution that's similar to honey, and other members of the colony protect it, and the honey ants feed the colony. Of course, we have leafcutter ants who cut pieces of leaves and take them back to their nests where they use them to grow fungal gardens, which serve as a food source for the entire colony. And who can forget our army ants who engage in bivouacs moving across a particular terrain and eating everything that comes into their path. Ants are really cool and they have a lot of different behaviors and those behaviors are entirely the result of communication, particular chemical communication from the pheromones that the ants produce. The question that we're going to be talking about in this video is how is communication actually used in biological systems, particularly with regard to behavior? In this video we're going to look at responses to communicated information and we're going to talk about some evolutionary perspectives on behavior and how behavior works. It's important to understand that just as communication is universal, behavior is universal. This plant is demonstrating a phototropic response. It's growing towards a light source. That is a behavior. A behavior is a response to a stimulus. In this case, it's the direction of the light source that's driving the response and the growth pattern of the plant. This is a relatively simple behavior, but behavior does not even have to be this complex. These Bacteria are growing in response to different light patterns, and you can see the images that they're making as a result of this phototropic behavior. These bacteria are absolutely behaving, just as any biological system that can respond to stimuli would be doing the same. And organisms that we don't usually think of as behaving can have behaviors that are pretty complex. The dictostelium slime mold engages in a variety of different stages in its life cycle, moving from a single-celled amoeba-like cell to a multicellular aggregate that travels as a unified multicellular variant of itself to a new area where it grows into a fruiting body and releases spores that can land in new areas where they'll turn back into amoebas and repeat the cycle over and over again. This is probably a somewhat surprisingly complex series of behaviors that this slime mold is engaging in, but that doesn't matter. It's still engaging in this series of responses to the stimuli in its environment. It's behaving. The only thing unique about animals in terms of behavior is the extents of their behavioral responses. And this is in turn connected to their extensive sensory systems and ability to get information about the environment. Animals have the most extensive sensory systems among biological lineages, and as a result, they have the most extensive behavioral responses, some of which you can, you can see here. For the rest of this video, we're going to focus exclusively on animals due to the extents of their behavioral responses. And we'll start with a discussion of proximate versus ultimate causes. And for that, let's look at the specific example of the waggle dance in honeybees. This is a well-known behavior that honeybee colonies engage in, wherein foraging members of the colony transmit information about the sources of food to the other members of the colony by doing a highly stereotypical pattern of movements that looks superficially like a dance. The number of waggles that the foragers do translates to the distance of the food source from the hive and the angle at which the wagglers waggle translates into the angular direction from the sun that the food source can be found in. Interestingly, though it's a bit of an aside, this is often done in the dark, so the waggle dance information is not conveyed to the other members of the hive visually, it's conveyed by the other members of the hive feeling the pattern of the waggles. Regardless, it's useful when talking about behaviors to consider the proximate and the ultimate causes. The proximate causes relate to the short-term benefits of the behavior. In the case of the waggle dance, it locates the food source for the hive and enables the hive to survive. 
ultimate causes refer to the evolutionary basis for the behavior. In this case, and in most cases, the ultimate cause of the behavior is that it's providing the hive with a fitness advantage by having their members engage in this particular behavior. As long as a behavior confers an adaptive advantage on the individuals that engage in it, evolution can absolutely act to drive the development of that behavior throughout an entire population of organisms like these honeybees. This is particularly easy in the case of something like the honeybee, since the waggle dance is almost entirely under gen direct genetic control. Similar types of direct genetic control are seen in the ants that we started off this video with. Behaviors that are under genetic control are often referred to as innate behaviors. These can be things like fixed action patterns, such as the aggression displays seen in fish like these male sticklebacks whenever they see an object in their environment that have a red underside, or the grasping reflex that newborn infants can engage in almost immediately upon being born. They can also be a little bit more complex, such as these imprinting behavior that are seen in many young animals in which they fixate on and begin to follow the first moving object that they see once they are born. Innate behaviors have to be largely under genetic control since there's no other way for the organisms that engage in them to learn these particular behaviors. But it doesn't have to stop with innate behaviors. There are a variety of learned behaviors that we see in animals as well. Hunting behaviors and other types of complex behaviors are taught by older members of a population to younger members of the population as those younger members mature. Even though these complex behaviors are not under direct genetic control, the role of genetics and the variations that genetics produces within a population of organisms absolutely plays a role in determining the variations that are seen in complex behaviors as well. In a group of stampeding horses, for instance, not all horses will stampede in the same direction or even stampede at all. That is a variation, and as we know, variations serve as the raw material for evolution. Those horses that do stampede may be at an advantage or they may not, depending upon the cause of and the outcome of that stampeding behavior, but the fact that that variation exists means that evolution can work upon those behaviors even though they're not under direct genetic control. At the very least, the capacity to engage in those behaviors is to some extent a product of an organism's physiology, which is a product of an organism's genetics. Evolutionary perspectives on behavior can also help to explain things like altruistic behaviors wherein an organism engages in a behavior that doesn't seem to benefit it directly from an evolutionary perspective. There's no particular benefit to this monkey by grooming this other monkey. It takes some time, it takes some effort, it takes some energy that the grooming monkey could use to do other things that could help it survive in its environment or even find a mate. But grooming behaviors are widely seen in populations of animals. One possible reason for this could be the benefits that such altruistic behaviors give the population as a whole, particularly if that population consists of closely related individuals. By working in altruistic ways to ensure the success of close relatives, an individual is working to increase the reproductive fitness of at least some part of their genes, even if they're not working to increase their own reproductive fitness directly. We can certainly see this when an adult member of a population engages in an altruistic behavior that risks their life for the life of their direct descendant child. Even though their life is at risk by helping their direct descendant child survive, they are in effect helping their own genes be passed on to the next generation. The final point that I'll make here in our discussions of behavior is that extra genetic information can easily be conveyed to organisms that have the capacity to learn it. The entirety of extra genetic information in a particular population is what we would call a culture, and we see the influence of culture in societies of organisms. The transmission of behaviors and strategies for surviving and reproducing in environments and having a more successful experience living in the world can absolutely be passed from society member to society member, leading to new strategies and practices by the members of that society to help them survive and reproduce in their environment. In this way, the extra genetic information of culture can be acted upon in Darwinian capacities, wherein that cultural information that helps members of the society survive and reproduce, survive and reproduce is passed on, while other information may not be as easily transmitted through generations. Thanks so much for watching our discussion on communication and behavior. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can explain what behavior is and the evidence that it's universal in biological systems. Make sure you can explain why animals have extensive behavioral responses and give examples of innate and learned behaviors. And finally, make sure that you can describe the roles of genetics, evolution, and culture in the emergence of extra genetic behaviors. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment here at the end and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.